everybody and welcome to our session today, Cloud Your Way, only from SAP. We have an exciting uh, debate. First, we're going to start with a little bit of overview for from uh, Mr. Simon King, our VP of Southwest and Regulated Industries, and Joe Zarb, our VP of SAP Rise Customer Edition. So here's what we've got in store today. We're first going to, like I said, we're going to give you a little bit of overview, a little bit of background information, um, talk about business transformation. What are the options for cloud your way? Are you going to the cloud? Is the cloud coming to you? What's really the right way for you to adopt cloud into your organization? Then we're going to have a little bit of a spirited debate among the three of us. And then finally, we're going to ask you what your thoughts are on uh, the information we've pre presented and the debate we've had and, and what is the best way for you to move to the cloud. So with that, I believe I'm going to turn it over uh, to Mr. Zarb and you're going to start things off for us. I am, Allison. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for setting up this uh, presentation. It's a pleasure to be here and thank you all for joining. Uh, let's just hit on why we're here and what we're going to learn, what we're going to get out of this. You know, SAP has always been a customer choice, customer first organization, and sometimes there's so many choices, we might make it a little difficult for our customers to figure out the best path forward. So we're going to, uh, between Simon and I, we're going to share with you um, some of the thoughts that we go through in terms of how we've packaged solutions and how we bring them to market. So we want you to understand um, what business transformation is and the intelligent enterprise from an SAP perspective and how we deliver a rapid, agile, and profitable approach to the cloud. And then really share some experiences with you in terms of virtues, vices, and trade-offs. Uh, what's the right option for you? And then uh, some of the things we're gonna learn is about business transformation, the intelligent enterprise, uh, different types of pr uh, private cloud deployment options. That's really important. It's private cloud deployment options. We're focused on hyperscaler versus a cloud within your own data center. And then we'll talk about some of the influences that drive some of those decisions. Sometimes they're driven by customer business requirements. Sometimes it's the external world. And then uh, we'll just uh, get into sharing with you how you could learn more and stay connected with us as well. Thank you, Allison. All right, so this first slide's mine as well. So, you know, when you talk about business transformation, people often assume, oh, business transformation, it is what it is. Uh, but at SAP, we kind of have a, a certain way of looking at it, and we'd like to walk you through that. The three things, the what, the why, and the eyes. The eyes are the inhibitors, and we think that cloud is a great way to hurdle those inhibitors. So let's walk you through that. If you could advance, uh, Allison. So when we talk about the what, Traditionally, you know, you can kind of go out and Google this. This is an SAP making it up. You'll find uh, different types of business transformation. There's cultural, there's organizational or management transformation, there's business process transformation, there's business model transformation, and then information system. Sometimes people call that IT transformation. Sometimes people call it digital transformation. But if you look at those five different types of transformation, Oftentimes, many of them are working consecutively. So if you're changing your processes, you might be thinking about how to rethink your culture or even your organization to adapt to those new processes. Almost all of it from SAP's perspective is delivered through digital transformation in some capacity or another. If you advance the slide, Allison, so why do it? Why do it? It's, these are you know basic building blocks of driving a smart, an intelligent business to continuously hone best practices and systems to grow share market share and revenue to optimize costs and boost customer experience right so you know you could check 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 those are all areas that every company should be worried about particularly coming out of a covid era and then unlock uh, unlocking untapped potential and markets oftentimes that means taking intellectual property whether it's your business processes your route to market or your offering your product service offering and getting it out to market in new and novel ways and then candidly it's it's to crush the competition it's to be ahead of the competition to create a non preemptible competitive advantage so the eyes the inhibitors let's go through those you know creating a transformational case is complex let's face it what we're trying to do is change an engine on a jet plane while the jet plane's flying 
This is non-trivial for any organization. And then from an SAP perspective, to be a value-add supplier, a trusted innovator, uh, we want to get into the mix and share your pain and help you with that transformation. Then really managing different stakeholder expectations, customers, employers, and uh, employees and suppliers, really uh, getting their sentiment, getting into their head about what they think about the tra uh, change to de-stress it and to keep communicating with them. Second, uh, third is the cost and complexity of business process transformation. It, it, anytime you're changing anything, there's gonna be uh, some positive effects and some adverse effects and how do you manage through all of that? And then the mismatch between existing and required skills to enable that digital organization. So there's really a training and a skills enablement. And in some times, organizations have to make that transition uh, with either introducing new skills into the organization or retraining uh, skills that are there. And then, of course, there's external forces, and these can't be ignored. Uh, they're governance regulatory, industry compliance, and things such as sovereignty, keeping data within a country, or residency, keeping data within your four walls, uh, depending on the industry you're in or the region you're in. So anyway, that covers really uh, the high level on business transformation. I'm going to ask Simon to help me with the whole intelligent enterprise side of the equation. Absolutely. Thanks, Joe. And I, I think the, the interesting part for us is that when, when you think about businesses today, there's still a significant number of organizations who run largely manual processes. And, and really they use the system to provide them information and to guide the process, but, but that's about it. You know, significant human intervention is, is still required in every step. Um, and that creates reso uh, you know, both resource constraints and, and multiple points of failure within an organization. And so when we think about what the intelligent enterprise is at SAP, you know, we're thinking about an end state where, where the system is effectively going to run, you know, certain functions autonomously. It's going to learn those functions. It's going to learn to get better at those functions over time and, and with minimal human supervision, right? And, and the goal, of course, is actually to free up those resources who were previously doing the repetitive manual tasks um, and, and who were constrained by those tasks to then actually go and engage in the activities that drive the company's key initiatives. I mean, and it is not an uncommon conversation uh, for me with any you know, C-level executive that says, hey, I've got a significant amount of my you know, people process and technology invested just in keeping the lights on. It impacts my ability to do projects that the business care about. Um, and, and that's an unacceptable state for where we are right now. And so, when we think about SAP Rise as part of that business transformation story, we're really thinking about how to augment and, and really accelerate the delivery, the, you know, sort of the, the delivery model transformation as part of this. And, it, and, and the idea is to enable and uh, the wider technology and business transformation itself by driving greater accountability towards SAP to provide that sort of consumption-based outcome as a service. Um, and so if you just go to the next slide there, Alison. And, and so SAP has actually been a private cloud solution provider for, for many years. We have a significant amount of experience in this space, uh, nearly 2,000 customers running over 40,000 systems. Um, and I think the, the feedback has been consistent for our customers across this entire journey. And, and it breaks down largely into three buckets. The first bucket is, Join us where we are on the journey, right? Making a cloud decision in any way, shape or form is a big watershed moment for an organization, right? Don't ask us to simultaneously make multiple other watershed decisions at the same time. It impacts the business case. It makes it more complicated. And ultimately it delays our ability to do any transformation because these things become bigger and bigger and bigger with more and more stakeholders. And less and less ability to, you know, to sort of control the outcome. Um, the second piece is SAP is part of our ecosystem. We're not the ecosystem, right? You know, we are, we are um, you know, one significant voice, but one voice amongst many in the choir. And, and so give us the ability to extend our applications. Give us the ability to integrate with other systems easily. Um, you know, and, and really, allow us to buy standard functionality off the shelf when we need industry capability, when we need differentiation, 
But if we're going to, but when we need, you know, to pick up on your jet engine uh, analogy before, Joe, when we need a Cessna, not a 747, give us a place to give us a place to actually build that innovation in a fail fast environment. And, and that's the business technology platform, right? And that's sort of that colorful piece that's built in here. And I, and I think the, the third bucket is a lot of customers feel like they're stuck, right? Their legacy systems have had, you know, a myriad of configuration changes over time, all of which made sense as they did them. Um, a lot of which now don't make sense based on the new business initiative. And, you know, that went with configuration. It went with custom code. It went with a whole bunch of things, all with the best of intentions. Um, but now they find themselves in a place where they can't actually take the advantage of the continual innovation that SAP or any other vendor is driving into that, that digital core because they haven't kept that core clean. So give us that place through Rise. Help us with the governance. Help us with the accountability that allows us to keep that core clean and, and actually you know, continually innovate and, and take that persistent innovation that SAP is driving into that cloud. And so if we just move the slide forward there. Um, and, and so with all that in mind, you know, Rise has evolved from SAP success in that private cloud to try to take advantage of all of these things that are being asked for. We're trying to simplify the commercial model. We're trying to improve the operational model. Um, and, and really, again, it's all driven to this idea of consuming SAP as a service, right? And, What's become clear as our customers have embraced Rise, and they have embraced Rise, which is fantastic, is that for some organizations, that the idea of the cloud is still this very nebulous concept, right? You know, there, there is concerns around security, there's concerns around data sovereignty, all the points you brought up before, Joe. And, and so, you know, one of those fundamental questions has now become, you know, and it, it says it on the slide, and it's really what this is all about is, does the cloud actually need to, do, does the customer need to go to the cloud or does the cloud actually need to come to them, right? And, and one of the things as part of any hybrid cloud strategy, and this is where SAP is saying, we will join you on the journey, is to say, we're willing to, make, we're willing to help you make that decision. We're not going to force you down a path you may not be comfortable with. Um, and, and we're willing to bring all the benefits of sort of that outcome as a service model and give you the flexibility to choose the approach of, of which you want to go. And so if we just advance the slide there, Alison. And so really where that leaves us is to say, you have all the benefits associated with Rise. So if you want to look at the industry and line of business specific transformation packages, if you want to look at out of the box process intelligence, if you want to look at the ability to have the networked ERP to collaborate with suppliers and partners, you want the accountability to SAP for, to actually have that agreed uptime at all times up to the application level. You want to be able to extend. You want to be able to innovate. You don't want to lose the ability to choose within your ecosystem of picking your system integrator, of picking the, of picking the partners you work with. You want to use the infrastructure of your choice. You want that governance model driven by SAP across all accountable parties. You can have all of those things. All SAP is now saying is we are actually going to bring that to you in different flavors based on where you are on the journey. And I think that's a critical evolution for us. And so I'll just pause there, Joe. That's, that's really the overview of why we're here today. That's great, Simon. Thank you. So Joe, back to you. How do our partners really fit into this message? Yeah, so, so we've got a bunch of really great partners here, and they're also suppliers to SAP. Traditionally, when a, a customer would come to SAP looking to go to the cloud, we would uh, discuss our various uh, services and products we can offer, and then it came down to an element of customer choice. So from a hyperscaler point of view, we'd ask the customer, where would you like to run your workload? Would you like to run it with Microsoft Azure or Google Cloud Platform? or AWS services. And based on the customer's priority, we would honor that. They sign a contract with SAP. We assure the SLA. We take responsibility for the architecture and the underlying reliability, serviceability, manageability, uh, performance of the underlying stack and platform. Uh, and the customer just has to interact with SAP. Of course, if they have other workloads in that environment, and that hyperscaler environment makes life simple. From a customer data center point of view, 
we use the exact same mindset, the exact same model, but instead of taking the customer's workload to a hyperscaler, we actually deliver a mini hyperscaler to the customer. And I call it a mini hyperscaler because it's not an appliance. It's a rack, it's got compute, it's got storage, it's got uh, networking capabilities, it's got redundancy in terms of power, it has the SAP platform on it, and it's ready to go day one. And we do that with two of our choice suppliers, both Lenovo and Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Lenovo has an offering they call TrueScale, HPE has something they call GreenLake. Together, all of it is an infrastructure as a service from an SAP point of view. We'd like our customers to embrace that same mindset as well. Now, the last partner who's kind of in the middle here, Intel, I'm going to bring them up because there's just an army of gerbils running and spinning wheels to keep these systems up and running. And uh, the more gerbils and spinning wheels you have to keep these systems up and running could oftentimes introduce uh, cost, complexity, risk. What we've done is by standardizing an architecture at the lowest level, at the uh, chip level, what we're able to do is assure that all of the device drivers, all of the software that's built on top of software and layered up really provides the level of uh, performance, reliability, serviceability, and manageability that our customers demand of us so that we can assure them or extend to them a very high level of availability and service level agreement. So uh, we really work very closely with Intel across all of these partners. Okay, great. And shout out to them for for sponsoring this debate in this session today. So thanks for going over that, Joe. So that concludes kind of the overview portion of this. We're gonna start with a debate, but before we get into the nuts and bolts of our debate, uh, I believe we have a poll for the audience. So uh, Jenna, if you're there and you can throw that up, that would be great. And we'll give you guys just a minute to that. I will stop sharing. I believe we'll just be cameras at this point. And so let's get into it, guys. So with the flavors of rise that you've each laid out today, what other considerations should be taken in making this decision? And just give you, I'll just give you a couple of examples of, of where, where my thoughts are right now. So does organization size or industry, do those things matter? You want me to go first, Simon? You go ahead, I'm ready. Yeah, so, so from a, a customer data center point of view, if you want a mini hyperscaler to be delivered and run within your data center or co-location facility, um, there are definitely some hurdles. Um, it's it's a, a slightly different environment. So what we find is the major business drivers, as we mentioned earlier, data sovereignty. Sometimes there's national security standards that have to be adhered to. Other things are in some in industries, data residency is very important and then uh, latency sensitive applications as well, where you really wanna make sure that all the systems are running with extremely low latency. Um, the other aspect, which is a risk driver, is data entanglement. Some customers have a very large number of SAP applications in their landscape. They also have non-SAP applications, and the integration and intermingling of those applications when they choose to go to the cloud they might say, boy, you know, I really need to move my whole data center to the cloud, not just my SAP landscape. And I'm not sure if I'm ready for that. I'm not sure if I want to incur the cost and risk. Having said that, where we really see customers gravitating to um, customer data center, it tends to be in uh, the Middle East, in Southeast Asia, Latin America, Eastern Europe, and then for select industries on a global basis. So that's public sector, a lot of government uh, entities. Uh, second is regulated industries like uh, water, gas, and electric utilities. Some telecommunications companies and ISPs uh, prefer not to put their workloads into a hyperscaler. And then um, others like uh, banking, finance, and insurance, sometimes when they're dealing with complex either industry laws or uh, uh, government or national regulatory compliance requirements where they have data from customers uh, that are candidly span the globe, they, they tend to have some uh, requirements for it as well. So it, it's, it's a subset of really the overall uh, data uh, and IT market. Okay, Simon, anything to add there? 
No, listen, I think Joe described it well. There's a number of hurdles before you would want to go with a, a customer data center edition over, over a hyperscaler. I think a lot of the things that um, you know, he's describing from a, uh, from a constraint perspective are, are things that SAP has thought about at an application level, right? And, 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 and a lot of what we're trying to do with the hyperscalers is effectively create a model where customers don't have to concern themselves with, with, with what the cloud actually uh, will mean to them. Um, and I think they'd be surprised to find out, you know, a, a significant amount of their workloads today for any SaaS portfolio of their board are likely, are likely with hyperscalers today. Uh, and so I think the, you know, for, for me, as I think about um, why hyperscalers uh, and, and whether there's any constraints on industry, yeah, you know what, there are some, some pieces around data sovereignty and, and, and those customers who, who want to see their systems in their, in their data center, who want to be able to touch and feel <laughs> that, that, part of, that, that part of their world. Um, but, but I also look at it and sort of say, you know, the hyperscalers have created, you know, up to IL-5 level capability to, to interact with the government, right? And, and, you know, SAP takes advantage of everything that the hyperscalers do well. Uh, when building our reference architecture. And so I, I, I look at this as, as an opportunity for SAP to continue to expand its footprint of hyperscalers uh, leveraging that reference architecture and, and, and minimizing those reasons why they wouldn't do that. Great. So what about... If I, you know what, let me plug one more thing else and I know we're okay. going to belabor this, but there is also a costing equation to this. Um, and so what I would mention is that the customer data center option tends to lean forward to what SAP calls the larger enterprises up into our very large enterprises. So if you're kind of like an SMB account or a small and medium business, generally um, rise in a hyperscaler is probably the best solution for you as well. There is that economic dimension that we didn't hit on. Okay, yeah, so you just mentioned SMBs. My next question was gonna be about organizational size and implementation times. So what are we looking at there? Yeah, that's another really good question. So I think in terms of organizational size, it's not so much about size. Generally from an SAP perspective, um, you could have a very small company, but it has a very large amount of data and a very large complex computational requirement, or it could be the type of company like a retailer that might sort of contract and then really boost during the holiday season or something like that. So, so there's that dimension to it. Um, however, um, what, what we're seeing is that it's really uh, customers that are at from, and this is from a customer data center point of view, they're mm -hmm. typically around two terabytes and scaling higher in terms of their scale up. So it, 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 again, it tends to lead more to a large enterprise to much larger enterprise uh, for those requirements. Okay, and Simon, what about smaller? I mean, for, yeah, for, from a hyper from a hyperscaler perspective, I mean, we we have multiple customers today who run systems as small as you know 128 or 256 gigabytes, right? And we have customers who are up at at you know 64 terabytes, right? They're, they're, the 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 I don't want to say the world is their oyster when it when it comes to the hyperscalers, but it but it, it it you know the the entire point of the hyperscalers, it, you know, it says scale in the word. The, the intent is their ability is to scale based on the size of the customer. Um, and, and I think to Joe's point before, the ability to scale leveraging cloud economics. Um, and, and I think what's important for you know, people to understand from an SAP perspective is SAP has made a significant consumption investment with every single one of the hyperscalers. And so we take advantage of that unbelievable buying power that we have for the benefit of our customers, right? So the customers don't have to engage the hyperscaler. They're effectively taking advantage of SAP's buying power rather than the buying power that they themselves have. So, you know, for a customer who, who may only need a 256 gigabyte system, fantastic. Uh, they're getting the pricing that SAP gets for a 256 gigabyte system because we're buying, you know, petabytes of space, right? right? And, and and that's, that's a critical capability, right? That, that's a critical reason that, that customers move to the cloud is to access those cloud economics. And SAP is effectively saying, access them based on our scale. Don't buy yeah. your house, don't buy your house, use our hotel. Right? right, I would see that as a huge incentive for smaller customers with smaller workloads. 100%. 100%. Okay. So I would compliment that. I agree with everything Simon said. I, I think what I'd also point out is that the 
the suppliers that we work with, the partners we work with on the customer data center option are also some of our largest suppliers. We run the 11th largest data center. So we're, we're consuming a lot of that. And we, we do extend those economies of scale to the customer data center customers as well. The other thing is, and, and Simon's you know spot on about this, about burstability and the elasticity that comes from a hyperscaler cloud. We, we do the same type of thing for customer data center, except it's not, it doesn't have that unlimited dimension, right? So the way we manage that is we typically deliver about 20% more capacity than most customers need. That gives them the ability to have a full landscape. So dev, test, QA, prod, sandbox, they could spin up virtual machines, very similar to a hyperscaler on demand. But what we do is we monitor and manage it. And if they start to spike and constantly constantly burst, we contact them and say, hey, look, you're bursting, you know, we strongly recommend you consider an upgrade. And so at that time, we sort of, we do our best to create that cloud-like elastic environment. And we've architected the system so that it can scale up like that, maintaining the ill ease, reliability, serviceability, maintainability, manageability, et cetera. But uh, Simon's points are, are spot on. Okay. So either way, you get a lot of elasticity in, in that's the goal. That's what customers uh, want. You know, I think yeah. Simon could attest that as well. So uh, I listen, I agree, but it, it feels like we shouldn't have done a dry run though, Joe, because you're really just trying to take the debate points I was going to give you. And, and but that's it. why I want you to go first. <laughs> that's why I want you to go first. I just <laughs> rebut and I say what he said, but for my offering, that's yeah. <laughs> what he can do. I can do better. Yeah, yeah exactly. apparently so. Okay. Apparently so. so we've talked about workloads quite a bit. What other deployment complexities should be taken into consideration? Simon, I'm going to start this one off with you. Um, listen, I think I think the deployment complexities are largely taken care of by SAP, and and I actually and I actually think that's true of both offerings, right? I mean, when when you think about what you're getting from SAP as part of a Rise subscription, you are getting a fully functioning system, right? You you know you we, we're not showing up with an infrastructure as a service model and saying, here, go, you know, go install the software, go, you know, go start doing all those things that you would typically do uh, in that scenario. We're showing up with an installed system, a ready to go set of best practices um, and, 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 a, and a mode where you start immediately getting into configuration, right? And, and that is, you know, that is a significant advantage, I think of going down the rise model. I, I often have conversations with customers who are sort of like, hey, you know, you're telling me it's going to take, you know, two weeks or so uh, to have the system available. And I'm saying, yes, it will take me two weeks because I'm not handing you over a piece of infrastructure. The infrastructure I, the infrastructure I got on day one, that was, that was very straightforward, no different than you would get it. Um, but then we went, we built our security model on top of it. We went, we, we got your networking sorted out. We, we it, you know, we installed the software. We did all these different things that could well have taken you four to six weeks because they're complicated pieces of work to do. And instead we're handing it over to you in two weeks ready to go. So, you know, I, I, I when I think about deployment complexity, I, I actually think again, in the spirit of accountability, SAP is taking greater accountability for that. Um, and that extends to when we're actually looking at, you know, you needing to take system copies to run, you know, projects and things like that. SAP doesn't just, again, hand you over the infrastructure. We take a full system copy of your environment. We actually set everything up. We build it into the same security network, all of those kind of things. And, and we sort of ensure the syncing between those two systems so that you, you, you know, you're consistently working off a, you know, a, a synchronous environment. And, and that's, that's a critical capability that a lot of organizations underestimate the amount of time, effort, and money that goes into actually you know, doing that during a project. And we, and we should be focusing on the project, not the tools that actually make the project happen. Right. So, Joe, I see you nodding a lot. I'm assuming same applies for the no, data. It does. It does. But I'm going to I'm unfortunately going to have to advocate uh, aspects of this answer to Simon because he does have a bit of an upper hand here. And so let me just and, and the objective here is to educate the audience to make sure what the you know virtues, vices and trade offs are here. So um, when we're putting um, a system inside a customer's data center, the customer is both a customer as well as a supplier to SAP. So what do I mean by that? We need space. We need heating and cooling. We need electricity. We need right. access to the big eye internet. We need locks on your doors and windows, right? So we need like a tier three data center. And then um, 
So that takes some planning, right? So we go through a discovery workshop and we'll work with them to understand that. The second thing is, uh, the reality is there is a, a, a silicon uh, supply chain issue right now currently. So we typically work with the customer once we have things spec that adhere to their power, to their spacing, to their location, we're connecting cables and stuff. Uh, we then uh, work with them and give them a schedule. It's not uncommon. It's not uncommon that the schedule could take 30 to 45 days to get kit to the customer location. It could take a couple of weeks to get that kit stable. SAP comes in, we put our platform on, we put our tool chain on. The tools we use to remotely monitor, manage, and assure uh, the availability of the solution is identical to what Simon's team does with the hyperscaler. So it's a very consistent experience. Uh, you get access to a customer portal, so you could kind of shadow everything we're doing while we're doing it, which is all beautiful. But it, the reality is there's, there's a significantly longer time lag, 45 to 60 days, with the customer data center option versus a hyperscaler play. So that, okay. that does need to be noted. Yeah, that's good to know. So uh, before we move off of, of deployment issues, any gotchas, anything you've seen that it's like, oh gosh, wanna make sure I mention this or any other comments around deployment before, before I go to my next question? I think that I listen. I think the only thing I, I just want to add, and I think this is again in the spirit of educating, right? You know, the the somewhat ironic part of this is Joe and I are arguing two different sides of the same coin. Um, but but I but I do want to make sure for the fact that, you know for the fact that we have SAP customers you know watching this is um, you know my my sales team like like we said at the start runs sort of across uh, across the country. Um, we also position customer data center edition when it's the appropriate thing to do, right? You know, the, the idea behind Rise is to figure out what the business outcome is. So you're not going to see my team come in and say, hey, you know, the correct answer is CDC, but because we want to sell hyperscaler, we're going to go sell hyperscaler, right? Like the, the, the intention of this conversation is absolutely to educate. And I, I don't want to get it, give anyone the impression <laughs> that we're going to push you in a certain direction because it's the direct opposite of what <laughs> we wanted to do. Spot right? on. Yep, spot yeah. on, Simon. Thank you. Yeah, and, so and what, think, yeah. Go, go ahead. Did you want? I was to... just going to say, in terms of additional deployment, um, you know, complexities and things like that, I, I, I really, I, I don't. I, I think what customers would really benefit from understanding, and 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 we're working hard with our system integrator partners as well to help them, you know, uh, get this piece ready. Is how they, what what we're looking to do here is is help improve their overall delivery model of SAP. What doesn't change though, is the way they deliver SLAs to their business, right? What they have underneath those SLAs that they're giving to their business as an IT organization is an ironclad guarantee by SAP that is significantly higher than what they would have if they have you know, four or five different players as part of that world, right? And, and so I think, you know, when I think about deployment complexities, when I think about all of that, I actually think of RISE as almost deployment simplification, because, be, but it doesn't change how it's being delivered from IT to the business. What IT is getting is the benefit of a much cleaner delivery model from SAP that they can then go brag to the business that they're doing things 20x better for 20x less, right? That's, that's a great story for everybody. Yeah, I, yeah, that's really spot on. That's really spot on. And that's not to diminish the role of partners. We still work very closely with our, our premier and our global um, and regional uh, systems integration partners. There's a lot of uh, industry expertise and skills they bring to the table, particularly from AMS services, functional uh, delivery of our solution. Completely agree. Yeah, so the, the other thing that I would add from a customer data center point of view, and I'm going to I'm going to plagiarize right so what I really like is uh, this this uh, research note that came from Gartner and they were talking about some of the things they, they call it distributed cloud as their offering and they talk about, you know, customers wanting the location of choice. So that's an important thing for customers to think about, particularly if you're also implementing disaster recovery. You're going to want to have, if you're going cloud, you know, at your data center, you're going to want to have multiple locations potentially if you want us also to manage disaster recovery. They then talk about the need to have a single tenant 
No other customer shares the hardware and service data guaranteed to stay within the environment. You know, so check, check on that. So keep in mind that you're, you're having that and it's going to be co-located with your other applications. There are some nuances with networking, but we generally work with you and work through that. And then this isolated control plane for a private self-service inter interface portal, that actually you get from both the hyperscaler side as well as uh, from the customer data center side. And then uh, it's delivered as a service. So it's an OpEx, it's not a CapEx per se. The caveat to that, and maybe a minor exception is for some regulated industries, when they look at the customer data center option, after they talk to their accountants and they talk to their auditing firm, they might say, you know, this customer data center option looks like a CapEx lease to us. From an SAP perspective, it's an OpEx cloud. But sometimes some customers, when they review the contracts and they look at it on an internal point of view, it comes across as a CapEx lease, which helps them with their ratepayers and regulatory bodies to justify certain investments. So again, there's a couple other dimensions that are commercial and financial and technical that slight nuances over other deployment options. But again, we'd be happy to walk you through those. Okay. Uh, we do have a question in the chat. Before we get to that, um, I would say anyone else has questions, please put them in the chat. We'll try to get to as many of those as we can before the top of the hour. But Joe, earlier in the conversation, you mentioned um, regulated industries. And so I'm a little bit curious about um, what do folks in regulated industries or any other, you know, industry that uh, has a, you know, high security concerns, what are the security considerations around that? So we'll start with you, Joe, with the data center, and then Simon, we'll move over to you. Yeah, so I, I th I'm hoping our, our answers are very complementary, right? So one is from our perspective, there's the physical security that the customer owns. They have to put the locks on the doors, right? But when you come into the world of security within SAP, we are, of course, a, a German headquartered company. We take this extremely seriously, GDPR and uh, data integrity and security. So having said that, we have an entire stack of security from every uh, aspect of data storage, data encryption, and then we have binding agreements for data trust and uh, data um, access. In general, as a general rule of thumb, you gotta uh, divide data into two streams. One is what we'll call payload data. It's the customer's data, their data of their business. The second is telemetry data. That telemetry data is, you know, is the fan in the computer spinning? Is the disk drive full? You know, so it's kind of like data about the data. And that telemetry data is really what SAP accesses to make sure the environment's up and running. In those instances, in those instances, very, very rare occasion that our software would fail. Very, very rare. But if that, that was a joke. All right, so if it, if it does fail, right, and we have to go to level two and level three support, we right. do what we can to obfuscate your data so that our support people can understand where the anomaly is and they can fix the code. Um, so from a security point of view, we do everything we can to basically separate ourselves from uh, the payload data and then to, you know, candidly put it in a digital lockbox to the best we can. We also work with third parties who come in and audit our security practices and our security standards and we publish that as a report. Simon, anything you want to, anything that's different on your side? Uh, I don't know. I actually think it's very complementary to that because, again, it's all part of the the, the reference architecture itself, um, which which is really what SAP is is sort of trading on, right? Um, I, I think that the one piece I would add is, you know, within the hyperscaler world, because we do do a significant amount of work, um, you know, in the uh, regulated space and 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 certainly within the government. Uh, we, we have a wholly owned subsidiary within SAP called the SAP National Security Services. And it's in, and its entire being is actually leveraging, you know, AWS's GovCloud, Microsoft Azure's Government Cloud, those kind of things, as opposed to the standard version of those hyperscalers, because they are ITAR compliant, they are FedRAMP compliant. And, and so the, the, the message here on the hyperscaler front, I think, is th there are no there are no constraints as to how we can deliver against the security requirements. The question is, what are those specific security requirements that you need? Do you need 
you know, only uh, US-based citizens accessing the data? Do you need, you know, does the data have to stay in North America or Europe or wherever you happen to be, right? The, the data sovereignty that Joe was talking about before, but I'm, I'm yet to come across a situation where we haven't been able to find a resolution to how SAP handles the data. Um, and largely that comes down to the fact that at its, at its most core principle, the customer itself controls the access to that data and to client zero, 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 no different than how it's controlled today with SAP support. So all of those customers who are SAP support customers today, it is exactly the same experience of allowing SAP to access your system in the cloud as it is to accessing your system in its on-premise environment today. And I think that's one of the biggest concerns that customers have is that something has changed. The, the reality is only the customer can grant SAP that access full stop. Yeah, that's spot on, spot on. Okay, so we just had a question in the chat about governments moving to cloud systems for health data, national security data, or do they prefer physical servers housed within their own environments? You kind of touched on that in your answer, Simon, but I'm just curious just to give a complete answer. Um, you know, what's it taking to onboard those government entities to cloud or to, or to data, I would assume data center would be their own. So probably not a question for you, Joe. <laughs> Well, I, you know what, let, let, if you, you don't mind, Simon, just a, a yes. slight tweak on that. Um, so there's a couple things on data sovereignty and then also skill sovereignty. So what Simon had mentioned, like when you think of NS2, they really address the needs of what are called the five eyes. So they're the English speaking countries so the United Kingdom and the United States, Canada, New Zealand, Australia are all covered uh, in, the, in that service. So that's important to note. Um, however, uh, what we find even with, you know, it depends on the ministry. So even within customer data center option, there are certain times if it's a, a, a defense department or an intelligence agency might not be the right solution, customer data center, even though it's running in, in your data center, because we're going to have certain nationals that are going to be remote and monitoring it. We might have people from India or Germany or the United States. Now we do things to funnel that. So if you're in Europe, we assure something called EU access. So they're European citizens that access that. In other parts of the world, um, it, you know, it depends on the ministry. So uh, uh, I would just throw that out there. Anything to add there, Simon? Yeah, look, I think we are consistently seeing government, uh, government agencies and, and, and significant government investment in cloud, full stop, right? Um, and, and that, that doesn't just apply to SAP, right? That, that applies wholly and solely. Government, like everyone else, is, is looking to take advantage of the cloud. Um, I think what we are seeing, what we are seeing from uh, customers is, particularly in the government space, is ed the education of what SAP is doing under the covers is critical for them to understand whether they are going to meet their cloud security requirements or not, full stop. And so, we spend a significant amount more time with the government customers in the roles and responsibilities. Uh, we spend a significant amount of time in SAP security framework, um, and we spend a, a, a large amount of time educating them on what our national security services offering actually is, so they understand what it's going to need in, in order to tick the box of those pieces. So the cloud economics is you know, critical, um, that they, they want to take advantage of subscription software and that outcome of the service that I described. Mm -hmm. um, but, but like a lot of regulated industries, the, the third box and maybe the biggest box is if security or an audit don't say yes, that's the end of the discussion. Um, and, 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 to Joe, and to Joe's point, it tends not to matter where the infrastructure sits. It's the principles around how that data is accessed and how that system is accessed. Um, more so than is it in this data center or that data center? That's right. Okay. Uh, pivoting now, a uh, question around recent utility trends. What are some of the notable benefits that RISE can provide when it comes to asset management for utility organizations? Uh, that's kind of a broad stroke question, but I don't know if maybe you have some that's Simon's backyard. I was going to say that's yeah. So so I actually was at I was actually at the utilities conference last week, uh, speaking speaking to a number of utilities uh, customers, and and I think um, the the interesting part for utilities for me is that uh, 
I, I've been doing, I've been in the utility space now for about seven years and, and it's the most CapEx friendly environment that you can imagine, right? Um, and, and so the, the, the IT organizations, the technology organizations are almost, almost being seen as like a leading indicator for, for, for these organizations that are so CapEx friendly of, can we genuinely make this transition to a recurring revenue-based entity, right? Um, you know, what does, the, what does the future look like for us? And, and largely it comes down to the fact that their ability to, you know, manipulate the rates and actually create how they, you know, how they draw revenue as a company is, is, is significantly more tied to their ability to depreciate CapEx spending than it is to OPEX budgets, right? That's just the way that most governments, local, state, federal, whatever it happens to be, have allowed them to price their services over the years. Um, and so as we've started working through sort of the benefits of Rise, a lot of those customers are looking at it and saying, okay, I understand that I would be, you know, from a, from a depreciation perspective, um, buying on-premise licenses, buying hardware, buying all these things allows me to do certain things from a financial perspective. What it doesn't allow me to do is actually take advantage of the things that I want to do from a cloud perspective. Um, and, and so asset management is a, per a perfect example. <laughs> Utilities don't need Joe. They, do <laughs> they don't need Joe. You can, be on mute. you can just stay on mute. I think it's probably best for everybody. <laughs> um, but I, I, think, I think that it's, it's more the modularization of the cloud that is, that is critical here, right? And, and, and this is where I think the hyperscalers and, and sort of the model under the hyperscalers make a world of sense, is that we're not saying you have to do everything in the cloud on day one. We're not saying that you actually need to, you know, you need to, if you just because you move your asset management capability that you also need to move your finance capability or your supply chain capability or your maintenance capability, whatever that happens to look like. Um, the idea behind Rise in, in the hyperscaler model is you take advantage of the systems as it makes sense. You innovate as it makes sense. You transform at your own pace. Um, and as it, rela as it relates to the asset management piece, if that's, a, you know, sort of a specific security uh, question, because obviously with the Colonial Pipeline and a few other things like that, we, we have had some interesting conversations recently around NERC data, how we would handle NERC data. We've had some interesting conversations around, um, you know, uh, where <laughs> should your ERP uh, be holding, you know, potentially, uh, you know, nuclear reactor designs? Um, but that's an application level discussion. That's, you know, that's, that's less about the cloud. That's more about how you're using SAP, right? And, and I think uh, when we get into that space, you're really talking about, hey, we need NS2 and we need ITAR, you know, we need IL5 or IL4, whatever we happen to need. That's when that discussion takes place. Okay. Joe? Yeah, no, I think I think Simon's spot on uh, with this. I think, uh, you know, the point I was making when I held up that little sign is that, you know, uh, again, going back to how you might uh, justify a CapEx expenditure for a cloud offering, you know, PECDC does. it. I want to clear, I don't want to get thrown into SAP jail for this. So after <laughs> you discuss this with your accountants and your auditing firm, they may reach that conclusion. I'm not saying that it does, but it, it, it's potentially there. The other thing I'd mention, and, and this is true for Simon and Hyperscalers, as well as it is for customer data center option, I mentioned Lenovo and HPE as well. We have a, a whole network of global tech partners that sell edge devices and sell mm -hmm. um, devices that could be put on a telephone pole and the like, and, and they're hardened and IEEE. And so really managing that asset uh, communication from you know, your feedstock to your distribution um, uh, SAP can work with you to put that together where a component of it might be cloud, but then elements of it might be at the edge and we could bring partners to bear for that for sure. Okay. All right. Changing gears a little bit. Another question from the audience. After moving SAP to the cloud, what happens to third party add-on applications? Do they migrate to the same cloud? Are they displaced or what? Is this where I should get my sign ready because they definitely need me, or do you want to go again, Joe? Like, where do you want to <laughs> where, where do you, where do you so, want to start? So I, I don't know what Simon's talking about. Don't displace anything. Just keep it in your data center, and we'll bring the cloud to you. 
Um, just you no, know, so two se seconds on that, uh, and uh, Simon can elaborate on this as well. We we try to what what we've done in terms of our SAP Cloud offering, and this is either in a hyperscaler or in customer data centers. We we really look at the SAP landscape in its totality. So it's you're talking over a thousand SAP SKUs that could be handled as a private cloud offering. It includes over 200 non SAP SKUs that are most commonly found within a, a, an SAP landscape. So we're, we're certainly not ignorant to the other uh, tools and services that our customers want to access. And we've done everything we can to actually package them as part of the SAP service. Now, again, uh, like I mentioned, if you're going to the, if you're bringing the cloud to you, uh, hopefully it's less disruptive and uh, less e uh, easy to maintain the integrations you have. But having said that, I'll pass the ball to Simon because we, we certainly have approaches to addressing All that. right. Before you pass the ball, the, the simple answer is you keep your third party applications. Where yeah. they are. OK, just want to make sure. I, it's got to be super simple for me to understand it, Joe. <laughs> Simon, anything to add there? You get I, I'm assuming as a, in the hyperscale model, you get to keep all your applications and your add ons as well. Any different? Yeah. So, so again, it's a, it's an application level discussion. It's not it's not a, it's not about the cloud model itself, right? So, so SAP has um, you know a significantly large uh, included list uh, we call it now um, of tolerated third party systems, right? Um, the the key part for customers to understand is SAP goes through a rigorous certification process with any partner looking to looking to leverage data from the SAP system or looking to interact or integrate with the SAP system and that's not that's not to close the system down that's to protect our customers you know and the integrity of the data underneath right and and so when, when you think about how that works um, you know typically speaking we will have customers who will migrate certain third-party applications to the same hyperscaler that we are migrating the remainder of the SAP environment to, and then use the MPLS or the standard BNet peering, whatever that looks like, to have you know, our, you know, our SAP stuff sitting right next to their third party stuff and, and integrating as if it was sitting in the same data center. So Excellent. there's no issues there. It's all, it's all about SAP protecting your investments that you've made up until now. Okay, great. So we have just a few minutes left till the top of the hour. I think we've covered all the questions that have come from the audience. So any closing thoughts, anything you want to add in here before we let this group of people go? Um, I believe, uh, Jenna, we have one more poll for the audience. Maybe we can throw that up while these guys are making their, their closing arguments, if you will, for why their way is the best way. Um, yes, <laughs> it, 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 it says I can't vote. It says I can't vote, but it's pretty clear which way this is going to go. So <laughs> I, was, I, was oh just, I was just, I was hoping to give Joe just a one vote. He would never know it came from me. Oh, um, oh, oh, this is just brutal. You guys aren't competitive <laughs> at all. <laughs> so, so, so what I, you know, what I would mention is that you know it, the reality is it, it's all about customer choice. So we want customers to have that diversity and plurality of choice. Um, having said that, if you look at the hyperscalers themselves, um, they've looked at the market and um, Azure has an offering that could run on prem. I think they call it Azure Stack, or I think they might have renamed it. Um, Google has something called Anthos. AWS has something called Outpost. Generally, those are more kind of appliance oriented, but they extend the cloud to a customer's premises. Recently, Google had an announcement that you know they're very much committed to core, what they call the cloud edge and core, uh, where they're sort of putting a mini hyperscaler at a customer data center as well. So I think the reality is, and, and Simon hit on this really well in the last question, he, he said it's all about the application and the use case, right? It's how, how you're going to consume the information. Do you take the, the processing to the data? Do you take the data to the processing? What makes the most sense for your business? So what I'd say is that even the hyperscalers um, and SAP, are, are all trying to chase the wants and needs, hopes and dreams of our customers. And we need to be flexible to do that. And hopefully what you take away from this is we're very serious about the cloud at SAP. If you can't get to it, we'll bring it to you. We're very serious about it. Okay, yep. Simon, I think he took uh, the words out of your mouth, but I'll-, I'll he, 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 did, he did, but I, I really wanna emphasize one piece, right? Which is 
there are going to be customers where it makes perfect sense to have both of these offerings. There are, there are going to be customers where it may, like it, this is, this is the, the in, entire intent of what SAP has done here is to create a series of hybrid options because no customer is going to run in a single hyperscaler. No customer is going to run solely on premise. No customer is going to do any of those things, right? Like there, are, there is going to be a multi-cloud strategy and a hybrid layer to that multi-cloud strategy. And so when, when SAP is coming to talk to you about what your cloud strategy is, it is 100% as what is the outcome that you're looking for? What is the application that would drive that outcome for you? And, and the delivery model of you know, RISE and, and the flavor of RISE underneath that is the enabler of getting that outcome. It, it's not, you know, that's not where the value of SAP is. This is accelerating your achievement of that value of SAP. And, and so walking away from this, I think, I think the, the critical part for, for our customers to understand is we're trying to get you to the outcome. These are different methods of getting you to that outcome, but it's all about enabling that success. Yeah, so so at the end of the day, you and Joe are on the same side. <laughs> in in the customer way. side. We're on the, the customer, customer side. Okay. Jenna, do you have the results of that last poll? Just curious to see how things shook out. Oh wow, really close. Uh four for uh for private edition with a hyperscaler, three for data center, three still not sure. So this is right. This is outrageous. This is <laughs> <laughs> so, gentlemen. I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I, I'm taking that as victory because those three that still are unsure, they're going to stay on prem and move to the cloud. I'm loving gotcha. it. <laughs> so I just want to say thank you both for your time today. Thank you, Intel, for allowing us to have this session. Before you leave, audience, um, as you leave this session, there will be a pop-up window and there will be information about what we refer to as a discovery workshop. For those of you who are still unsure, this is great information for you. You can spend some time, you know, scoping things out, learning about all the, the various cloud opportunities. So I highly suggest you take advantage of that. And with that, gentlemen, I think we're done. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks, everybody. Great call. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it, Allison. Thanks, Jeff. Cheers. All right. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye.